It looks like. Yeah, yeah. Should we start it? Yeah, yeah. Should we kick off? Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Killer Keller podcast. Um, it's early morning. It's one of those mornings because I'm delighted to have a, someone of very high caliber, some 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 high EQ. We share a very similar thing in common where that's concerned. Sean Wallace, Dr. Sean Wallace, um, graduate, uh, lawyer, uh, 2004 Mastermind Champion. That's correct. Today is the 14th anniversary of my victory. I think. I put one of those, you know, audio. Yeah, you do. Uh, awesome. Cheers, and uh, nice yeah, to meet you, bro. you too, brother. Yeah, you yeah. too. Yeah. And uh, in case you may recognise the face, yes, he's the uh, the international face of one of the chasers from the TV hit show The Chase, which uh, is always impressive. It's always impressive to see. You nail it. Uh, I've I'm, I've become more of a, a marathon fan of it now. It's on like uh, the TV, the Challenge TV now. You know. Yeah, it's on Challenge TV. It's on uh, ITV Four in the mornings. It's uh, everywhere, really. It's. Do you get like that kind of sense of you turn on the TV and you can't get away from seeing you on there? It's, well, I'd rather be on a show where, you know, we're seen all the time. Who would not want to be on a show where, you know, you're virtually plastered across uh, all forms of the medium? It's, it's true. It's true. How did that come about? Like the whole, I mean, we will get into the other bits yeah. and bobs. Because mm-hmm. we've also, if you don't know, I'm sure it'd be even closer to the time when this comes out that you've got a book coming out as well. That's correct. Yeah, in October, it's called Chasing the Dream. Yeah, so I don't want to give too much no. bits and bobs away. Do you yeah. know what I mean? But... um. Yeah, man, how the, how on earth do you get yourself into a position where people are hitting you up for your intellectual properties for something so on the money? Um, it first started, I suppose, when I won Mastermind. It opened a lot of real doors. I was the first black person to apply for the show, let alone going on to win it. And obviously, you know, so far as the uh, public attention was concerned, it was fantastic. And it did open a lot of uh, doors and opportunities for me. I was working on radio for... Four, the best part of four years on Radio 5 Live. Prior to that? Yeah, prior to that. Because you're a football fan, aren't you? A big football fan, big Chelsea fan. I was going to wear my Chelsea shirt, but I thought out of <laughs> deference to all the podcasters who <laughs> may not be Chelsea fans, so <laughs> yeah. I better not wear it. I won't do the demographic of how much you alienate the, the audience. Yeah, I can so imagine. I, no I can idea. imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, so after winning Mastermind in 2004, I retired from quizzing because it's the pinnacle of all the quiz shows. It's one of the, if not the most iconic quiz show in the world. And I thought, well, you can't win any uh, higher than that. And uh, I retired, but I was asked to come out of retirement in 2008 uh, because BBC TV's eggheads were looking for a new egghead. And oh, I, I remember that programme. Yeah, yeah, well, it's still on, on BBC Two. Right. And I got all the way to the grand final. And lost, sadly. Uh, but uh, every cloud does have a silver lining. And uh, ITV saw that. And they asked me to actually take part in, uh, in an audition for an exciting new quiz show. So I was working on that show for the best part of four months. Mm. Uh, both myself and Mark Labette, also known as The Beast, we went up to Manchester to do a 10-show pilot in June of, nine, of 2009. 10-show pilot? Yeah, 10-show pilot. Wow. And the rest, they say, is history. It's... Um... That's an interesting prospect, the idea of you going with someone else of such equal high yeah. calibre. Like when it's when you're working with those those kind of levels of and friendships, is there like a rivalry? There can't be a rivalry because when I was the first uh, chase appointed, I'm always known uh, by uh, the chase in London, the production team as the world's first chaser. And when I first met Mark, first thing I said to him, listen, in order for this show to be successful, we have got to respect each other's abilities. We've got to support each other when we're doing well, commiserate with each other when, we're, uh, you know, when we've lost. And that's the sort of ethos which binds all the chasers who've been subsequently added to the show. So we all get on well as a family. There's no rivalries because if there was... Uh, you, yeah, it would. It would. So you'd, you'd, you'd see it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you would, wouldn't you? Um, you see it in bands, you know, when you have like boy bands or girl bands. You of see course, the yeah, you, and, you, and you see eventually them, you know, splitting up, going on to sort of side projects or solo projects. Yeah. So, uh, you know, with us as chasers, uh, you know, we all get on very, very well. We all have different strengths and weaknesses as uh, 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 quizzes in generally, but uh, collectively we're a, a great group. That's awesome. That's awesome. And when you, when, let's backtrack a little bit. Mm-hmm. Growing up, you're from around this, this area? Uh, yes, I was born on the 2nd of June, 1960. Um, I was born in Central Middlesex Hospital. Mm-hmm. I've lived on the same street. I'm not going to mention that street, just in case I get sort of hassled for the last 56 years. And uh, <laughs> It's important to be uh, in a place where you feel comfortable and where everybody knows your name, according to the sort of Cheers lyric. Absolutely. I can go anywhere in the world 
And uh, when people ask me where I come from, once I mention the word Wembley, they know exactly where I come from. They know exactly where you come from, yeah, exactly. you know? Yeah, so, uh, you, know, I, you know, I just love where I live and uh, I'm comfortable and happy. Wembley. Um, what was it like growing up as a kid uh, around, uh, around that time? Happy. Um, you know, I've still got the same friends, um, although they sort of scattered to different parts of uh, uh, London and different parts of the country. We still have that same tight knit closeness as friends mm. and it's important to, uh, to have that closeness because no matter how successful or how famous you are mm. it's always important to remember where you come from mm. and with me as I say I like to keep my feet firmly on the ground uh, and stretch as high as I possibly can yeah, go. Absolutely man um, when when you what was this college you went to what was the university? Well first school I went to uh, was a school called Copeland High School, which is on uh, uh, Wembley High Road. Uh, it's now called the, I think it's the Arkan Academy. So um, when I went there in the 70s, um, you know, educational um, philosophies and attainments in relation to young black students uh, were completely different than it is today because mm, uh, mm. they expected you either to sort of work in a factory uh, or if you were a, a young black woman to sort of be pregnant and end up in a council house. When that I was, was 11, like the, yeah, the when I was eleven years old, I wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, the first letter I wrote uh, was to the uh, bar council when I was twelve years old, and I remember showing that to uh, uh, my careers teacher when I was fourteen. When you embark on the O levels, and she said, "You, Wallace, best thing you're going to end up is in prison. If not, you'll end up uh, sort of sweeping streets." She was right about me ending up in prison, though. Although she forgot to say after having seen my clients, I can go home again. Really? Okay, I get you. It's funny because uh, I had my mate Spider J over here not so long ago. Um, podcast came out a couple of weeks ago. And he was saying that for him it was very much the same. He came from Dominique, his family. Um, very, very well spoken. And people, I think of that era, that time, people just had ex very low expectations. Very low expectations. If you were black, if you were female, they didn't expect you to do anything in life other than, you know, if you were a woman, they expected you to sort of end up in typing pool or sort of, uh, you know, uh, be a secretary. Yeah. Uh, and if you sort of dare to dream... Uh, of anything higher than uh, your so-called limit or expectations. Uh, They'd sort of, you know, try and sort of pull the rug under you. And that does have a, a profound effect on young people because, you know, um, you can either carry that chip on your shoulder and sort of, you know, uh, believe that you're a failure before you mm -hmm. start. And, you know, the next thing you know, your future's behind you. Yeah. So I... Um, like to always encourage young people, especially young kids. I go into schools a lot. So I used to go into schools a lot, um, even before I became well known. And one thing I always say to young children is this: you know, I could be talking to the next uh, person who discovers a cure for cancer. Mm. I could be talking to the boy mm. who finally scores a winning goal that England will win the World Cup. True, because you never know. You're you are the future. Yeah. And uh, even though now I'm in a position of uh, you know responsible well, responsibility. Uh, and fame. Absolutely. I like to say to people uh, that um, I'm not going to be here forever. Yeah. Somebody's got to replace me. It's true. Why can't it be it's you? It's true. And you're adding just a, you're part of the bigger tapestry. Yeah, exactly. Um, nowadays with, with what kids go through, particularly with the internet being so prevalent, you know, um, and, and also what I'm finding really weird is like the parents are really disregarding the kids too playing on the internet, you know what I mean? It's like this whole kind of disparity. Well, what it is, as I say, social media does have a tendency, especially so far as the young is concerned, to have that sort of uh, disconnect yeah. uh, uh, with the adults because they get lost in their own world. And sometimes that is a danger, you know, because sometimes you've got, you know, the so-called dark web where young children yeah. are sort of, you know, curious and, um, and ex you know, want to actually explore. And next thing you know, they're exploited themselves yeah. that's why sometimes it's important uh, i'm not saying that you know young children shouldn't uh, be connected to social media because we are living in a technological age now yeah. uh, but you know you've got to strike a balance between knowing how to engage with people uh, and uh, you know knowing how to actually use technology to your own advantage and ends do you think do you think that that balance has been struck right now. Like when you go to the schools that you go to and you, you talk to the kids one on one, I'm sure the parents are as excited to see you sharp. They are. They do, are. Do you do you feel like there's a balance in like the way that that um, that middle ground of like kids using internet and? Well, I mean, I, I I don't know. The only thing I try to actually inspire young children is to you know believe in yourself believe that yeah. uh, the world belongs to you believe that you know you can achieve anything you like uh, mm. uh, in in life mm. and don't dare to dream 
I always talk about, uh, and I'm passionate about this, even before I became famous, I used to teach part-time as a lecturer to support myself at Hackney College, four nights a week for 14 years. Oh, you years. went to Hackney College as well? No, I taught there. Oh, wow. As a, law, as a, law, as a, as a part-time lecturer, you know, to support myself as a barrister. Busy man. <laughs> and one of the most important things wow. for me um, as a professional uh, is to try and say to young people, or well, how old you are, look, you can be like me. You can even be better than me. And I think it's important that uh, professionals like myself are there to, you know, to help you. Yeah, absolutely. The only thing I always used to demand of my students is that, you know, I'm prepared to give up my evenings. I didn't drag you here. So if you've got to work, mm. you've got to work. You've got to put the effort in. If you don't put the effort in, you won't uh, uh, reap the rewards. That's amazing. That's amazing that you can connect with Kids on that level. Kids, you know old I mean? people. Yeah. It's, uh, my 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 go-to phrase, and I don't want to sound sort of cli cli uh, cliched or sort of soundbite-ish, but so I always talk about the ladder of opportunity. The ladder of opportunity should be there for everybody yeah. to climb up. Yeah. And if you can climb up the ladder of opportunity, I put down for you and go beyond me. You know what? My philosophy must be correct. Yeah, absolutely. If there was the internet back in the seventies and eighties. How much of that would have been beneficial to you? I, I suppose it would have been beneficial because, uh, as I say, I'm a bit of a dinosaur. The only sort of computer I'm really good at is the abacus. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, uh, and I suppose it would have uh, been of uh, 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 benefit. I'm glad, uh, as I say, one thing I'm glad about is the era in which I was born. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I would agree sex with that. I was born, but more importantly, the color I was born. Yeah, so, you know, yeah absolutely. I have, I have no regrets about that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Challenges of the time, eh? Challenges mm. of the time. Yeah, of course. I think challenges, challenges and with with the internet, I'll stay on this for a second because it's really easy to um, get, there's so much congestion out there. I mean, when you do a podcast, you know, music, like trying to find new music now, there's not a, the, the direct portals. It's really easy to get distracted. Yeah. And I think with information, it's like, it's, information is passed so frequently and, you know, thoughtlessly. It's, you forget how important it is to actually garner and learn and teach yourself stuff. Of course, I mean, yeah. Outside of the schools, yeah. you know, uh, it's crazy. But uh, as I say, technology and the ever-increasing advances in technology is of benefit to mankind. It's the way in which it's used. Anything which is uh, yeah. uh, a new innovative, innovative um, concept yeah. will always be advantage to somebody as long as, long as you know how to use it. Mm. So... With uh, with mastermind in in that scenario in that scenario where you're you're faced with a number of hurdle weekly hurdles, mm -hmm. what the hell's going through your mind? What are you thinking? The, I had two advantages uh, when I went mastermind. Firstly, in relation to the subjects I chose, because they allowed me to choose football as a specialist subject. Okay, so they were already in trouble. Uh, they were bang in trouble when they allowed me to choose subjects like the European Cup final since 1970, all of England's matches from 1963 to all 2003. All right, And because I live close to uh, the iconic stadium uh, in terms of Wembley, FA Cup finals, well, my chances of uh, winning the competition went up. But the major advantage I had is my training as a barrister. Um, you know... You're taught how to research, you're taught how to remain calm under pressure, you're taught how to think on your feet, you're taught uh, not to panic in that situation. Uh, so the bar and my training as a barrister was a tremendous advantage to me uh, in terms of my game show career, mm. let alone winning Mastermind. Wow. You're in the black seat and the cameras are on you. Yeah. Like... Do you feel that? Do you feel the no, pressure? No, I didn't. Nothing. I didn't. Because the one thing I always say to quiz contestants is this. It takes courage to be a, a contestant in on the any place. game show. Yeah, yeah. You know? And the worst thing you can do on a quiz show is get a question wrong. Because then all of a sudden the snowball... F f yeah. yeah, yeah. If you allow that snowball effect in terms of getting a question wrong to affect you, then your performance will... Uh, uh, mm fall down I've seen it a couple of times on the chase of course, it, starts, of course. Especially it happens to me it's happened, it's happened to me in the final chase um, you know I don't profess to know everything if I did uh, I'd say I'd win everything but you're pretty good at it though ain't yeah, you yeah but who'd want to win a, <laughs> who'd want to win a quiz show where the chasers win all the time no, no. one no it's true so you know it's even true. Achilles has a heel yeah so um, <laughs> you know if I get a question wrong I mean one time I remember I lost £50,000 on this particular question what colours Marge Simpson's hair now, if you've never watched The Simpsons, you don't know. I've never watched The Simpsons. I had to think about it. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Apparently, the answer was blue. I yeah. said orange. 
One time I was one question away from winning, six seconds to go on the clock. They asked me, uh, what is the only African country which begins with the letter K? And guess what? Couldn't think. No, really? Wow. It's always the, fa- the failures that stick in your mind more than the... Uh, yes, it, yes, uh, and especially when, you, you know, uh, you're in my position. You, I mean, you're an aunt Sally, really, mm. ready to be knocked down, ready to be criticised. And uh, sometimes <laughs> on social media and on Twitter, it, he's rubbish. Yeah, he's, he's on, he, they're he on you, sacked. man. Yeah. Do, yeah. do, do, does, does that ever cross your mind? Like, if I get these too, wrong too many times, as the, cha- as the bona fide chaser, they're going to get rid of me. Like, no. it's nothing. Because they know that it's, you're not going to find anyone yeah, it, else. But you know what, guess what? I, I'm on a fantastic show, but uh, I'm not expendable. If they say to me, I've got well, to like go. Well, like you say, yeah, that's yeah. right. I see you. Yeah. There's I'm, not someone coming I'm not saying well, I wouldn't be disappointed, but at the end of the day, I'm not expendable. Yeah, no, I've, I've been there with the beatboxing. Like, if I, you, there's always someone behind you. There's yeah, always someone exactly. behind you. Yeah. It's a constant organism, constantly moving. Yeah, so, that, so that's why I make sure that I, you know, constantly revise all the time, keep myself up to date, yeah. uh, and all to stay on top of the game. And I've been in those situations where you get those, not necessarily the pilots. I mean, ten episode pilot that's quite a lot, isn't it? Yeah. But I've been on a couple of ITV pilots, and a lot of the times it's like, right, stop, camera, stop, blah, blah. and your flow is constantly compromised by camera change, or yeah. you know, let's wait for this next light to flick on, and blah blah blah. You know, check with the producers upstairs, sort of thing. Mm. It, it does play with your attention span doesn't it it does play with you not really because you know as long as you know what your role is know you know what you've got to do i mean i mean that's how um itv shows work that's how main game shows work that's how yeah. main programs work i mean although the uh, broadcasting uh final edit of the chase lasts an hour it takes two hours to film yes yeah, right yeah is that was that the same with eggheads and mastermind yeah it's the yeah, same all the same yeah thing. yeah i mean yeah. when we did the mastermind grand final i mean uh, they had loads of pickups to do and uh, I remember um, when I was doing the final, I didn't have my family there. Uh, I didn't tell a soul, actually. Really? Yeah. Uh, and the reason for that is because I didn't want the additional pressure. So I was the only contestant, a uh, six finalist, who didn't have his family there. So I wanted to be like the man with no name, you know, uh, in the sort of spaghetti western, sort of uh, right into uh, <laughs> down and right out with a spoil. The anonymity, yeah. yeah I exactly. think I, I feel that sometimes, like the whole idea of your parents being there, yeah, a big event. Yeah, it adds so much more yeah. anxiety to so, the thing. So the first time my mum knew, uh, the first time my dad knew, uh, I was in Jamaica. Uh, because, as I say, uh, I won it on the 14th of June, 2004, and they weren't going to broadcast it until December. So it gave me six months to realise, you know, this was going to change my life, but it's not going to change me as an individual. Mm. And sometimes I'd walk down the road and I'd sort of break out into tears and people say, well, you're right, mate. I was like, OK, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> so a week before, because I was the last person to qualify for the final, uh, I left... Uh, to go to Jamaica because it was I, I knew it was going to be the calm before the storm. So oh, that's I, such a good idea. So when I came mm. back, because uh, I brought a trophy with me, uh, and when I came back, I thought to myself, let me have some fun with customs. So I did. Uh, I made myself look so suspicious, like a sort of, you know, <laughs> arch typical drug dealer. So <laughs> I was approached by somebody from customs. So they said to me, uh, where you come from, sir? I said, Jamaica. They said, have you got something which you shouldn't have? And I said, I'm not sure. I said, better come with me then. Amazing. Amazing. So you walk into this room now, there's loads of people being searched. So he goes, where is it? I said, it's in that box. So he goes, you want to put the box on the table? I said, yeah. Plonk. Put it on there because they'd shown the mastermind uh, grand final the, the, day, the night before. So I pulled out the trophy. He goes, are you the bloke who won mastermind? I said, yeah. Everybody, Amazing. Everybody stopped what they were doing. <laughs> The guy wanted to pack my suitcases. I said, no, no, that's all right, mate. I'll pack my suitcases. That's so genius. I, I left my car down the road. Because I had specialised number plates. Uh, I used to have sort of B-I-G, S-W, whatever it was. <laughs> so I knew the world and his wife were looking for me. So the first thing I did after I left customs, I went straight into W.H. Smith. I'm on every page of the newspapers. Because obviously being the first black winner. It's a big it's a, deal. Yeah, it It'll be, it's a big deal when it's mastermind in yeah, general. So what I did, right, because it was late December, early December, and the, obviously the uh, um, it's going to be really dark uh, at dusk. So drove down the road, left my car uh, down the bottom of the road, put my hoodie up, walked past my house, just press outside my house, walked past them, walked down the alleyway, into my house. They didn't leave until 11 o'clock. My Ooh. phone rang 100 times. I had to pull the plug out. I didn't turn the lights on. Went upstairs, sat in the bath, 
No, I thought candles. Wait for them to leave, and I was starving. So I went to Aries Patty. I don't know if you know Aries Patty. Yeah, I do. Should be on Warm's Lane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had something to eat. Came home. Wake up the following morning. Picked up the trophy. Went across the road to me mum. Plonked it on there. I said, hello, darling. Yeah, mate. All right, all right. And she was in tears and sort of cursing me because I didn't tell her uh, where I was. Because when I left to go to Jamaica, I rang her up and I said, look, mum, I need to get out of the country. She goes, what's wrong? She goes, I feel in the week. Oh, mm. bless her. She must have been having a proper moment. Yeah, yeah. So the night they were, I won Mastermind, her phone rang 200 times. Uh, Bittersweet. My, she was like, he's won. Yeah, because you know? yeah, yeah, at the point, it was the closest victory ever. Uh, in the entire show. Wow. Because the uh, guy who came second, Don Young, was a top-class quizzer. He passed twice and I didn't pass. And people say to me, why didn't you pass you? And I said, I only pass when I'm playing football. Oh. <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> what an awesome story. Yeah. That is such a good idea. Yeah. The duck. By the way, Mazzy's inside the house. Say what's up, Mazzy. There you go, Mazzy's. A big shout-out to Rob as well. Maggie's finest. Um, yeah, so, like, the book. Hmm. The book. What? What's to expect in the book? Right. It's not a book uh, which is about sex, drugs and rock and roll. So if you want that, go and buy Katie Price's book because <laughs> it's not about that. It's a <laughs> book about inspiration. It starts and finishes when I just lost the Eggheads Grand Final. I was in the studio 13 hours. I was the only contestant out of the 32 entrants to have to play the quarterfinal, semifinal and final all in one day. So I just lost. Wow. I'm sitting in a car listening to Steely Dan's greatest hits because Steely Dan's... Uh, are one of my go-to groups. So I'm listening Amazing. to Babylon Sisters and I'm sitting there. I'm gutted. I've just lost, you know, it was my first defeat on a quiz show in five years and I'm wondering where it all went wrong. So within that year, what I did, I, I played back the uh, uh, CD to the back, uh, beginning and within that uh, hour, I was thinking about my life. So I thought to myself, you know what? This would make a good story. So I told the story from the 29th of June, 2008, right up until the same time and my life in between. And I want people to realise um, it was not plain sailing. I failed all over English language time uh, language five times. Five times. Mm. Went back in though five times. Yeah. So, and the message I want people to read from that is out of adversity. If you allow adversity to get the better of you, your future's behind you. You've got to keep on going. So, you know, I want people to realise it. Oh, you're a mastermind champ. You must be the cleverest person in the world. No, I'm not the cleverest person in the world because I wasn't born clever. More failures than successes. Yeah. <laughs> no, more successes than failures. But you uh, had as many... But, you had as many but yeah, outcomes. I've had my downs as well as ups. So I want yeah. people to read that and realise, you know what, guess what? You've been knocked down, you can get up and dust yourself off. Yeah. Right. And the so one thing, I, and the one thing I also uh, um, try to come across in the book, hopefully, is this: uh, no matter how successful you are, all it does is bring you to the start line of a different challenge. Mm. Doesn't do anything else. No more than that. Strong analogy. Uh, when because I do quite a few podcasts, and one of the underlining, the, the underlining commentary on a lot of people's minds is that. When you fall down, you get back up. Yeah. That's just the way. And I think that comes with a lot of successful people, or at least the, the ones that remain consistent in yeah. their abilities. And it's almost like a muscle, isn't it? And you know why? Because you're appreciative when you do get to the level of success that you hope to attain. Mm. You appreciate what it's taken to get you there. Mm. And it's um, what it's taken to get you there which keeps you at the top of your game. Because the minute you start to believe I've made it, that's when you start to lose it. With a lot of these game shows nowadays, staying on the game show theme, but, you know, the big brothers of the world and, the, you know, that sort of thing, a lot of times people just, like, they get they obtain this, this success within 15 minutes. Yeah. And then they lose it in the same way because it just doesn't stick. The right. Way. What it is, um, those type of reality type of game shows people, uh, their fame is ephemeral. Uh, ephemeral, they, what's that word mean? Temporary. temporary. Right. You have your 15 minutes of fame... Uh, and uh, you think it's going to last forever. Me, before I became famous, I operated in the dark. You know what? If they switch the light off, guess what? I'll still be able to operate in the dark. Mm. But those people who have the limelight and it's switched off, they spend their life trying to switch it back on. And you know what? You can't. Wow, that's an analogy, isn't it? That's deep. Yeah, that's true. You can't. You can't. If you haven't got this... It's a structure, isn't it? It's a structure. It is. It is. Uh, and, you know... Uh, people who uh, manage to actually stay on top of the game 
uh, do so for a reason because of their talent, because they appreciate what they are, and, and they they're constantly trying, changing, and they constantly realize every level of success brings you to the start line of a different challenge. So mm. You keep on growing, you keep on moving, you keep on going up and up and up. And the only time you stop um, evolving and achieving is when you die. Mm. And when you do die, the best part is the legacy you leave behind. Mm, yeah, it's true. That legacy is such a, it's a like I said, it's a little dot yeah. in the bigger tapestry. Yeah, yeah. And it's how much, do you, how much you affect people and change your life. So the book itself is an answer to your contribution even in schools, the stuff you do with yeah, kids, yeah. The, 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 yeah. the teachings you... Yeah, that's what's more important in relation to the sort of salacious tittle-tattle. Mm. Who's going to be interested in that? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I, and, and I wouldn't talk about the sort of, you know, personal relationships I've had, because you know why? It comes from a one-sided perspective. Yeah, the other person ain't there at all. They're, they're not there, yeah. right? And it might not be the uh, uh, how they saw the relationship we had. So that's not fair. And it's not important. Of course, it's not important. What's important is that the the, the craft that you've you're able to yeah. facilitate. And so shape that's it. what the book's all about, and it's enjoyable. When's it out? First week in October. First week in so October. So uh, that's going to coincide with Black History Month, and I'll be doing a lot of tours around the country. So I've managed to actually set that up. But uh, well, yeah, are yeah. you doing radio um, stuff? Radio, as well? TV. If you want me to come back on the podcast, I'll be back. I'll make sure that yeah. you're here first. Yeah, man. Yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, yeah. Just, uh, I'm not a football. F I'm not a football fan. I don't know enough. But please indulge. Mm -hmm. Please indulge. When were you into football? When did this begin? Right, my love affair of football also is in the book. It starts. It started really on the 20th of May, 1967. And the reason being, I used to have a big cousin who I used to really look up to, Roy Walker, uh, and he was a massive Spurs fan. And it happened to be the cup final that day. Uh, and his team were in the final. And just to annoy him, I thought, well, I'm going to support the team in the dark shirts. <laughs> and it just happened to be Chelsea. We lost 2-1. That's why I always hate Tottenham to this day. And how, how old were you? I was six years old, just before wow. my seventh birthday. Lifelong Chelsea supporter. Yeah. So, you know, one of the biggest um, things which happened to me is when we won the FA Cup for the first time. Yeah. And I cried like a little baby because, you know, I see my beloved team win. So that's what helped inspire me. So when I was looking around for subjects to choose on Mastermind, I mean, initially I was going to do Kings and Queens of England because I love history. Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to do um, uh, World Affairs since 1945 and FA Cup Finals. So they said to me, Sean, you can't do FA Cup, uh, Kings and Queens because somebody's already done it. And I was really, really disappointed. Oh, saying, yeah, of course, because if they've if someone's already done it, then you've already... Yeah, yeah, yeah but they've yeah. done it the previous year. Right. So I'm sitting around thinking, what can I do, what can I do? Ding! Football. Amazing. Amazing. Ding! <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the producer rang me up. I said, look, can I do all football subjects? So he goes to me, what do you want to do then? So I said, well, can I do Champions League show European Cup finals since 1970? I could have taken it back to 1956, but I thought to myself, why give yourself the extra pressure? 1970 yeah, yeah, yeah. was a seminal year for me because I would have been 10 years old. And you got this. Yeah. That's where you, that's where you first, you know, yeah. the things that stick in yeah. your mind is yeah. when you're young, isn't it? Secondly, I said, well, what's going to be your second subject? He said, um, can I do the... Because I used to love watching... Oh, as a kid, I used to watch all football matches. All, League Cup finals, FA Cup finals, you name it. Yeah. England football team. And because England were playing in Euro 2004 in Portugal at the time, I thought to myself, I that would make a sub lovely subject. Yeah. So I said, can I do all of England's matches at the European Championships? He goes, right. He goes, well, what do you want to do if you get to the final? So I said, well, can I do FA Cup finals? Because I only lived down the road from Wembley. <laughs> so they went away... <laughs> Two hours later, he said they gave it clearance. Once they gave it the clearance, my chances of winning Mastermind went up by 20%. Amazing. They don't Amazing. do those type of one subjects now. Um, they yeah. banned that. Uh, but the only reason I thought I could get away with it is because football is the number one national sport. Yeah. Not only in this country, but it's the number one sport in the world. Yeah, and the information's rife. Yeah. Particularly when you're in the area. Yeah, and the, I had some wonderful write-ups after I won. Uh, and... Uh, you know, people said, uh, you know, they're mocking football, but it's just, it requires the same intellectual rigour. Absolutely. So, you know, the way in which I approached uh, uh, that particular show was not to think like a contestant, but to think like a question master. What questions could they ask to catch me out? That's wow, the I mean, you must have had like a backlog of 
question and answers. Well, the way in which I propose, uh, I, I, I used to go up to the British Library uh, annex in Collindale because that used to be my sort of uh, home base when I was a law student. Right. So I got all the newspapers, all the cuttings, and I was going through them. And, you know, when I was looking, you know, it relived uh, the um, th- uh, um, f- situation in my mind. Mm. Then I'd go out, especially with the FA Cup finals, I'd go out and buy the DVDs, watch all the FA Cup finals. So I just watched them. You were predatoring. You were studying. Oh, like yeah, a, you yeah. were on it. But, but that wasn't my strongest suit because my strongest suit was a general knowledge. That's what you you can't be strong on the your special subject without having the general knowledge to back it up. Yeah. And my general yeah. knowledge at the time was, yeah, fourteen years ago I was really hot. I'm not. I'm not say I'm not so good now. Because I've, you know, I've had a lot of um, things which I have to do now. Mm. Uh, you know, go here, do this, do that. Life happens. So yeah, yeah life happens, and uh, I'm grateful for that fact. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, I'll, I wish I could get to the standard of where I was before because I'd like to actually challenge for like the World Quiz Championships or the European Championships. But uh, that takes a great deal of focus and intellectual rigor, which I could get back, but uh, I'm still a practicing barrister. Mm-hmm. So. All these plates. The <laughs> yeah, and I'll juggle them. Well, it's a pleasure. Thank you for sparing a plate or two uh, for the podcast, man. Cheers, KK. Nice one, Sean. Cheers, bro. Good KK. work. Thank you. Thanks, Mazzy. Yeah. Killer Keller podcast, live and direct, central London. We don't muck around here. We're staying. <laughs>